Hey everyone, Eric here. Just before we get to the show today, I want to let you know about the big changes here on our team. We've now got six editors in both Asia and Africa producing some great journalism every day on what the Chinese are doing throughout the developing world. No one provides this kind of daily coverage about the Global South from the Global South. And that's why governments, think tanks, and investors around the world read our newsletter every day and rely on our website. If you'd like to find out what they're reading and get a truly unique perspective on China and the world, subscribe today. Subscriptions are super affordable, and you get 30 days free just to try it out. So go to chinaglobalsouth.com slash subscribe. Once again, that's chinaglobalsouth.com slash subscribe. The China in Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa China Reporting Project at Witts University in Johannesburg. The ACRP promotes balanced, considered reporting on China-Africa relations through training programs held throughout the year. More information at africachinareporting.com. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast, a proud member of the Syndicate Network from SubChina. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, we're joined by our very own managing editor, Kobus van Staden from Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Hey, Kobus, quickly before we get started, I just want to give a shout out to our new Patreon supporters, Stefan, Newt, and John. Just such a heartfelt thanks to all of you for supporting the work that we do. If you would like to help support the podcast and the China Global South Project's work, we would be so grateful. You can go to patreon.com slash China Africa Project. Thanks again to Stefan, Newt, and John. You guys are all heroes to us here at the China Global South Project. Okay, let's get started, Kobus. We're going to kind of go back to a story that we've been covering for the past few weeks, even past couple of months, related to the blessing videos. Now, if you recall, the BBC did an amazing documentary. What was it, about last month or so? Yeah, about a month and a half ago or so. Yeah, and they exposed this awful exploitative video business where Chinese online users will basically pay between $15, $20, upwards sometimes as much as $70, $75 for these videos where people will hold up signs or they'll ask people to dance. Oftentimes they're quite benign, quite innocent, but many of the videos are highly exploitative involving children. Now, I have some updates on this. Well, I won't give you the whole background. If you want to follow what happened, go check out some of our previous shows also online. You'll see so much about this story. But let's kind of give you an update on where we are now, because a lot has happened in just the past couple of weeks. The 26-year-old filmmaker who fled to Zambia was quickly apprehended. His name is Lu Ke. And here's what's very interesting. After he crossed the border from Malawi into Zambia, uh, the Chinese embassy in Lusaka apparently helped in the investigation to find him. Zambian authorities then extradited him back to Malawi, where he was remanded to custody and swiftly charged with five counts of child trafficking. The speed that they've been moving on this is really very interesting. It's rather unfortunate for Lu that he is now going to face these charges in Malawi and before a Malawi court because more than almost any other African country, Kobus, the Malawian justice system has been quite strict with Chinese offenders. You know, in many cases, African courts, and we see this over and over and over again, they will remand a Chinese offender for doing something and then extradite him back to China and not make him face local consequences for whatever he or she did. But that is not the case in Malawi, where just last year, a court sentenced wildlife trafficking kingpin Lu Nguyenhua to a 14-year sentence and his wife to an 11-year jail term behind bars. They recently appealed their conviction just this year, and the court just said, no, nah, forget it. They dismissed it. So, there's a very good chance, Kobus, that Liu Ke is going to get the book thrown at him, and he could spend a very long time behind bars. And, and, and really what's interesting here is that you're getting a sense online, uh, you know, just following the discussions in Malawi and elsewhere, that the system, both in Malawi and Zambia, is actually working when you just see the speed of justice that's happened over the past couple of weeks. Yeah, I mean, you know, somewhat cynically, I have to say that that this tends to be the, you know, one tends to see this when when there's a lot of 
kind of popular anger about something, you know, related to this in African societies, then one sees African African lawmakers moving, you know, quicker than they usually would. Um, you know, I think it's also like just just from an African politician's perspective, this is a this is a perfect opportunity. You know, it's, it's like a it's a clear it's a clear moment of of, of victimization of African people by uh, by an other. Um, you know, which which then kind of plays very well. You know, uh, if if one can if one can portray oneself as as this kind of like enforcer of of, of African dignity. Um, you know, so 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 these kind of racial issues play both ways. But uh, but yeah. You know, kind of. I'm. I have to say, I'm a little gratified to see that he is act will actually be be prosecuted in in Africa. You know, kind of because I think Africans, you know, rightly take this these issues a lot more seriously. I think than they would be in China. Yes, you make a very good point about the fact that it's working in this case, and I guess for somebody who is a victim of crime in Malawi and sees that the system can work, and when they're facing the justice system and it doesn't work, it must be very demoralizing when you see it actually does work when they want to, when they're properly motivated as it is in this case. But today for the show, what we'd like to do is we want to flip the script a little bit. We'd like to not look at the issue from the point of view of Africans, which is what we did in our last discussion with Henry and Runako, who both produced that amazing documentary. But now we want to look at it from the Chinese perspective, especially from the business of these videos. And there was a fascinating article that was published earlier this month on the Tech News Magazine website, Rest of World, and was called Racist Videos About Africans Fuel a Multi-Million Dollar Chinese Industry, written by Viola Zhou, who is the China correspondent for Rest of World. A very good evening to you from Hong Kong, Viola. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, let's just start with, again, some of the basics of the industry and the business that's behind it. Maybe you, you can set up what are these blessing videos? I gave a little bit of an awkward description about it, but let's let's start at the basics before we get into the details of the business and some of the racial issues that permeate this industry. Tell us a little bit about what these blessing videos are for those who are not familiar with Chinese social media and haven't seen them, and what is the appeal of them to Chinese consumers? So these blessing videos, they have been popular for um, at least a few years. Uh, so the concept was like online, there will be like vendors selling those videos and then you can order them. You pay a very small amount of fee. Like they are very, very cheap. You can order a customized birthday wish or whatever you wanted to um, say to your friends, to your coworkers, or even to a pop star from these vendors. And then the vendors, they would ask someone in often in Africa to make these videos um, showing like a group of black children chanting the message that you wanted them to say. Sorry to interrupt you, but just to be very clear here, it wasn't only in Africa. We've seen these blessing videos in Eastern Europe. They've been produced out of Egypt. They've been produced out of other Middle Eastern countries. So the predominance is in Africa, but not exclusively though. Right, yes, you can see the popular genres, including like black children, there's a concept called um, like muscular African men. Like another popular thing would be Ukrainian women and uh, Egyptian men, I think. And um, there are also like other types from other regions. And did these start always featuring foreigners or, or was there a blessing video industry in China before foreigners got involved? They only feature foreigners. Oh, it's very interesting. Um, at least they are not mainstream, but like these type of videos featuring black children, especially, um, they are kind of mainstream. So like most of people or like many people have seen them online. So let's talk about the mechanics of how the business works. A couple of years ago, when the issue first arose for us, it was on the uh, Alibaba's massive e-commerce shopping platform called Taobao, Tmall. And people would advertise these videos on Taobao. Alibaba then banned them from Taobao. And Taobao, by the way, is kind of like in China, the combination of Amazon, eBay. I mean, take all of the online shopping sites that you have around the world, bundle them up, and they come out to be a fraction of what Taobao is. You can't overstate how important Taobao is in Chinese society. But so when Taobao took them off, everybody thought, well, this is good. This is progress. But as your reporting reveals, that didn't slow the industry down. In fact, they're now just on other social media platforms. So tell us where people can buy these 
And then also, what is the cost and what are the mechanisms? How do they pay for it? So like after Taobao bandits, they still exist on Taobao. They're just like more difficult to find. So like how Taobao bandit was like, um, they were ban the terms that were actually related to those videos, how people commonly call them. For example, like black children holding uh, a play card, things like that. But uh, the vendors, they would get around this by coming up with some euphemisms. Uh, maybe they don't mention black children or they only call it like birthday wishes. And then if you search those, those terms and then you look very carefully, you can still find people who sell those things kind of as an underground business on Taobao. And also like some vendors that have moved to other platforms like WeChat, um, they will advertise those videos uh, in their kind of in their WeChat um, in the WeChat moments, it's like a it's like a Facebook timeline. So you can just like order directly from WeChat. And also, if, if you look on Weibo and uh, on other social media platforms, you could still like find those vendors. It's just like more difficult to search for them. So Weibo, for those of you who are not familiar with it, is a site that is similar to Twitter, but a lot like Facebook, where you post pictures and there's comments and you build a community that way. Go ahead, Kobus. Um, and you point out in your article that some of them are also showing up on YouTube. And so so there's, there is kind of like YouTube monetization that's happening at the same time, right? Yeah. So after seeing this BBC documentary, and then which was like really painful for me to watch as well. And um, I was really glad that the person behind those terror videos, at least one of them, like Luca, was was uh, arrested and then probably would be facing uh, serious penalties. But I was also reminded of this like whole industry of other videos that are not blessing videos, but also like racist uh, and very stereotypical portrayals of Africans that are popular on Chinese social media. There is a whole industry behind them that is kind of like promoting this message of Africans being uh, inferior, um, being waiting for Chinese help, being waiting for Chinese aid. Um, so this kind of content is like further promoting this image, this very particular image of Africans among the Chinese audience. So before we get into the racial issues and some of the cultural issues that are shaping this business, I just want to stay with a few more questions on the business side of this. So there was a very interesting Twitter thread that came out after uh, this all exploded from the BBC documentary online by Alexandria Williams, who is a journalist who long time worked in China. She was then based in Nairobi. She's now uh, with Deutsche Welle. And, and she said that she used to work for one of these short video platforms in China. And what she talked about is is very much the same issue that we face in the U.S. and in other places with social media, that the outrage machine and extreme content tends to be rewarded by the algorithms of the social media platforms. And so for as much as we don't like these videos, as offensive as they are, as exploitative as they are, they show up in search. And the search engines and the, and the, and the social platforms like it because they generate traffic. So the mechanics of this in terms of what China says, we're cracking down on this, we're trying to curtail this is actually not true because the business behind it in social and search elevates these types of extreme videos. There was also a very interesting report in the South China Morning Post, and Viola, I'd like to get your take on this as well, is that the demand for these blessing videos went up during the lockdowns in China because people were isolated inside, people were stuck, they, and these videos gave them a sense of, you know, it was fun, it was neat. You could send a message by email or by text to somebody all the way on the other end of the world, and people start dancing for you, and so the blessing video actually boomed during the lockdowns earlier this year. So despite what Chinese officials have said, there actually has not been a curtailment of this industry. The social platforms that traffic these videos reward them by surfacing them up in search. Tell us a little bit about the availability of them in the past, say, six to nine months leading up to the BBC documentary. Yeah, so um, even like, I think that was like around 2017 that talked about bands those videos from its platform. But you can still like see from time to time uh, like similar type of videos on social media platforms. Because those companies, they are profit driven. They don't have any incentive to take down any popular content from their platforms because those content generates clicks. And then the social media companies, they need clicks to, to make profits. Unless 
the government tells them to, they wouldn't have any incentive to take down those content. Uh, on the other hand, the government also doesn't have a strong incentive to order such a crackdown before that BBC documentary was released and kind of like triggered a backlash in Africa. Like the Chinese government, they have a lot of things to worry about. And then they just don't see this kind of like racist content as an imminent threat to itself. So like those content would be kind of like going viral uh, on its own without too much interferences from the authorities. And yeah, like I think it's a good point that during the pandemic when people couldn't travel, a lot of people wanted to see this kind of like exotic content, especially that they enjoyed seeing like people of another race or people from another country kind of like serving them in some way. Oh, they are doing what uh, we are telling them to do. Um, like in Africa, in a far away place. So yeah, I, I do think this like this isolation during the pandemic has contributed to their popularity. So in, in your your reporting, you know, doesn't only in this particular article doesn't only focus on the blessing videos themselves, but like locates them in a wider kind of range of videos, including these weird kind of like beauty contest videos and you know kind of other kinds of like different kinds of representations of of Africa. And different kind of video, like kind of viral videos that, that pull Africans in. Um, but one of the one of the aspects that I wasn't aware of was how much kind of product placement is happening in these videos. And you point out that is that that aspect, the product placement aspect of it, is actually this multi million dollar industry. Um, so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how these about how product placements work in these videos. China has a massive influencer economy, and then in this economy, like if you are good at making videos, there are many ways for you to monetize that skill. The first way is like YouTube. So like the platforms, they will pay you if your, if, if your content generates clicks. So YouTuber also pays users if they ha- choose to have adverts kind of like in front of each video or like in, in the middle. So similarly, um, several Chinese um, video platforms, they also pay content creators if the videos are considered kind of like war, like worth um, advertising. And um, another type is product placements. So if you are a successful um, vlogger and then companies, they can contact you um, either by like DM you maybe. And then the social media companies, they also have some mechanism to pair uh, content creators with companies that need advertising. So you can choose to place your products in those like Africa related videos. For example, like one video I found during my, my reporting was um, this like uh, influencer in Kenya. Um, usually he would post videos of himself being surrounded by African women. Uh, and then they would like dance together or sing together. And then one video he was advertising a buyer mosquito spray and then the video was like africa has a lot of mosquitoes that's why you need this buyer mosquito spray um <laughs> and later like we contacted bio we were asked about this video and then they took it down they said it was a chinese uh, distributor's decision to play this product and another way to monetize is through like fans tipping so like when you are watch a live stream or you really like an influencer you could pay them uh, you could send them virtual gifts and then they can like exchange those gifts for money. And the last way, probably the most lucrative way is live streaming e-commerce. So several um, influencers in Zambia, they were running daily live streams. So every day during China's evening time, they will host um, several hours live streams where um, they will do a lot of things with their African employees. Um, maybe they were like sing together or they just sat there and chat. Or often it was like a Chinese host speaking to the camera uh, and their African black employees would be on the background sitting there uh, without understanding what the host was saying. And also like beauty contests. Yes, I, I saw like several um, influencers, they they held this like beauty contest parading black women. And then they kind of like made jokes about them, uh, even like asking them to repeat Chinese sentences that they couldn't even understand. Meanwhile, they asked the Chinese viewers to kind of like be the judges and the Chinese viewers would post live comments about oh this woman is more pretty that woman was less pretty like things very like misogynist comments like that um and then during those shows like the influences they will be selling all kinds of products snacks um 
clothes or like chili oil i've seen it um or just like groceries tissue papers the top ones they could make they could sell、um, millions of dollars worth of products in in just a few months So just to clarify some of the points that Viola made, and this is great, Viola, for laying it all out for us. But there is a very wide spectrum of Chinese content creators in Africa and in China creating some of this content, and it really extends from you know the highly exploitative what we've seen in what Viola, what you've laid out, also to a lot of Chinese streamers and and content creators who genuinely want to show a. More authentic, more accurate side of life in Africa. I mean, it goes from one extreme to the other. Now, many of them have been swept up in what has been a Chinese crackdown since the, the the BBC documentary came out, and there was an international outrage. Weibo has banned certain words now,、uh, "hegui" being one of them, and that's effectively the Chinese equivalent of the N word. And so that shows that some action has been taken. Also, Viola, you mentioned in in your reporting that they have now just kind of put a blanket ban on on the live streamers from Africa, regardless of who they are, whether they're engaging in some of these more exploitative activities or they're doing some of the great cross cultural introductions that are more sensitive, trying to educate people. All of it has been banned. Can you talk a little bit about what's happened in the past couple of weeks in the Chinese reaction? Weeks after the BBC documentary. I saw kind of like a quiet crackdown across different Chinese social media platforms. It was, it looks like something that was ordered by the government because, like, all the platforms they did this at the same time. So first, if you search Africa on the video platforms such as like Douyin, which is like China's TikTok,、uh, Kuaishou,、um, on Xiaohongshu, which is like kind of similar to Instagram,、uh, you will not find any accounts、uh, with the term Africa in its name. Uh, it just like shows no no accounts except for a few verified accounts. For example, like China Africa Association of、uh, some province, things like that. So you will not see any individuals with the name Africa in their in their handles. So all of these these influencers who spent years building up their audiences, some of tens, hundreds of thousands, were just wiped out.、Um, they're still there. It, it's just like you cannot find them. So the Platforms they kind of they have like kept them hidden there.、Uh, they still have like millions of followers. They they are still posting content.、Um, it's just like as a user, if you are thinking, oh, I want to watch a live stream in Africa, and then you search either like under under accounts or under live streams, you will not see the content. At the same time, they also banned those influencers from conducting live streams. But it seems the ban was. Reverse just a few days ago.、Uh, I was checking, but like at least for a few weeks, they were not able to conduct live streams from Africa. So you, in 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 your reporting, you locate the popularity of these、um, of these videos and the, the wider genre of these videos in the rise of of a kind of a racial nationalism in in China. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Like, what kind of role is this playing within larger kind of racial politics that that we're seeing emerging in China at the moment?、Uh, sure. So if you look, look、uh, if you look at the most popular influencers based in Africa, and then you will see some kind of patterns in the content they post. First is like poverty porn. They would often show a very underprivileged side of. Life in Africa, they will show like children、uh, or like、uh, older people、uh, living in poverty. And、uh, in those videos, like Chinese people, the influencers themselves, they often act kind of as a savior in Africa.、Uh, you will see them providing not only economic help to them, but also kind of like teaching them. Uh, Chinese culture. So one genre of videos that you would often see is Chinese people bringing donations to African people's homes. They will like bring food and clothes to the employees' places. And also、um, another kind of video is like Chinese people handing out like stacks of banknotes to the African staff. Uh, and then those employees, you will see them on camera, like seemingly very excited, or they will even like be filmed dancing after receiving their payments, which is like a very basic thing they should be getting. Yeah. So in those videos, you will see the Chinese people playing the wealthy, more educated roles, while they frame local people as kind of inferior, as even like 
pre-modern subjects who need kind of uh, a cultural enlightenment and economic aids from, from China. So instead of the white savior complex, which has been endemic for centuries, it's now the Han savior complex. Yeah, exactly. This narrative, even though like racism is not often discussed in China, um, this racial narrative totally exists, uh, especially with this rise of nationalism in the past decade or so. Because uh, Chinese nationalism, it has a very strong racial aspect to it. When the leadership is talking about the rejuvenization of the Chinese nation, uh, people imagine it as the rise of the Han Chinese people as a whole. Like often like they don't see African immigrants in China, for example, as part of this Chinese nation. So when they see content of showing Chinese people uh, acting as a savior in Africa, they kind of feel good about their nation. They feel good that China is kind of winning over white people to some extent in projecting its cultural and political influence in, in a very far away place. And you also point out that that you know in in terms of of popular discourses around racism, um, in, you know in China there's the 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 side of of the discussion um, where where people focus on Chinese Chinese people having historically suffered under particularly Western racism, that part of the discourse is a lot stronger than than discourse around Chinese as agents of racism. Um, you know, that, 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 that it's, it's not like, you know, kind of people within China are not very used to thinking of themselves as being, as having to deal with their own racism. Like they tend to think of, of racism as something that comes from external actors onto them. So most of the discussions about racism on Chinese social media uh, and then that's social media only. So like actually like censorship plays a strong role in this. Um, that's most of the discussions about racism is about um, Chinese people being the victims, suffering from kind of discrimination from uh, Westerners, Americans in particular. It's not saying that uh, all Chinese people are not aware of racism, but in recent years, because there's, um, kind of a rise of right-wing narratives on the Chinese internet. At the same time, a lot of people with more liberal views, they are suffering more from the censorship. So it just, as a result, um, those critical voices, uh, they kind of have been silenced. So you don't see a lot of voices kind of like challenging Chinese racism against Black people on the Chinese internet. But how much of it has to do with the fact that Chinese society is more or less mono-ethnic? So it's about 92-93% ethnically Han. And so what I hear in China is very similar to what I hear from a lot of white people here in the U.S., where you have a lot of white people who live only among other white people, and they say, I don't have a racist bone in my body. Donald Trump would say that all the time. And then they turn around to say all sorts of racist things, and they go, well, that's not racist. And they just don't have the software to understand racism because they've never been exposed to people of different ethnic, cultural, or racial backgrounds. How much of this has to do with the fact that they can't talk about racism simply because they don't really know what it is? I don't think that's true. Um, not At least not entirely true. Even though like the Chinese society is predominantly Han, but like Chinese people live in a very um, complicated media environment, for example. You see people of other races on TV. Uh, you see their images everywhere. Uh, you read about them. Uh, you also travel. People are definitely aware of the existence of people of other races. Even when they are talking about themselves being the victims of racism, um, they are aware of this global racial order. Um, they are living inside of this global racial order. So I don't think um, they don't have the ability to talk about racism. But I do think on the, on the very isolated Chinese internet environments with a lot of censorship, it's very difficult to talk about racism. Um, the discussion are often seen very one-sided. Uh, for example, uh, a few years ago, there was the government kind of like had this new policy on issuing permanent residency to foreigners in China. And then this uh, it triggered this like very strong backlash uh, from Chinese citizens about um, having like black people receiving Chinese green cards 
So they had this anxiety. What if like China became more black in the future? So they they're definitely talking about racism. They're thinking about racism. It just I think there's not enough voices that could challenge the Chinese racism against black people. Uh, at least on the on the Chinese internet. Um, you mentioned this this kind of idea of of a kind of a global hierarchy of races, um, and I've I've read very kind of interesting research, like historical research about that, like kind of locating when those those kind of texts arrived in China and kind of late in late kind of nineteenth century around there. And then you know how how they were kind of like taken over from kind of racial kind of racialist kind of thinking in in Europe, and then you know kind of incorporated into thinking in China. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that this idea in China about like global hierarchies of different kinds of races. Um, yeah, I was also asking a researcher who uh, studied the history of blackness in Ch- in the Chinese culture about this. I think there are debates about where this kind of hierarchy came from. But I think right now, we also shouldn't frame this as something that came from the West. It's like racism in China came from the West. Chinese learned about this hierarchy from Westerners. Like, it's really hard to find the origin of these ideas. China is definitely part of this global community that are living under this kind of like racist ideas. So help us understand what happens now. Where does this go now? So the Chinese government has taken some action. They reverse course on other parts of of, of those measures. But Liu Ke is going to face justice in Malawi, probably. And he's probably going to get a symbolically high jail sentence. What happens next, especially from the business side of you? Next year at this time, are there going to be these blessing videos and these exploitative videos? Or do you think they're going to be wiped out? What what should we know about what, what to expect? It's really hard to tell because um, the Chinese government, they only take actions against racist content when there's a diplomatic backlash. Because domestically, they actually don't see racism as a threat to its own. uh, The government doesn't see racism as an imminent threat to its own rule. Um, I don't think the government wants people to be more racist, but it just like is not seen as a serious problem compared with for example, direct criticism of the Chinese government. Um, Actually, it probably sees like liberal voices, um, voices that are against racism, that are also against feminism, against um, authoritarianism um, as a bigger threat. So they kind of like clamp down on those voices first. But after this kind of like diplomatic backlash triggered by the BBC documentary, the government's placed sweeping ban on all those live streams from Africa, on all those accounts. Really interestingly, over the past months, I saw, because I follow them during my reporting, and I saw some influencers, because they were banned from doing live streams in Africa, they moved to other countries just because of the ban. So they couldn't make more African content. So a few of them, a few of them moved to Nepal, so they can live stream from there. So it's really hard to tell, like maybe after the the anger towards these contents eased over time, the government would kind of be like, maybe it's no big deal. We can let them come back again. So they're going to find a way to continue to make money to do this kind of thing. Yeah, because the demand is still there without kind of like serious challenge, without more discussions about racism in China, the demand will still be there. Chinese people would at least like some viewers, they will still be enjoying this kind of content. They will be enjoying seeing, uh, for example, Africans um, speaking Chinese, Chinese people taking care of children in Africa. I do think the demand is still there. So I consume Chinese tech news at at an obsessive level, and I've been following this for years. And I got to tell you, Viola's writing on these issues is unlike anything else that I've seen. It's exceptional. Viola, you're you're doing fantastic work. The article is Racist Videos About Africans Fuel a Multi-Million Dollar Chinese Industry. is written by Viola Zhou, who is the China correspondent for the online tech magazine Rest of World. Viola's been covering tech in China for a long time uh, with the South China Morning Post, with Vice, and now with Rest of World. Viola, if people want to get in touch with you, are you on social media? Yes, um, you can message me on Twitter um, or on LinkedIn. 
or can just like email me um, at viola at restofworlds.org. And what's your Twitter handle? My Twitter handle is um, Viola Zhou, um, Z-H-O-U-N-Y-I. We will put a link to Viola's Twitter handle plus the article and some of her other reporting in the show notes. Viola, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate you staying up late this evening. Uh, it's fascinating. And once again, thank you for such great reporting. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Kobus, that was such a treat to hear from Viola about these issues that she covers, especially because of the fact that she's in Hong Kong, she's Chinese, and she has a perspective on this that we really don't get to hear very often. And I feel like she helps to fill a very important hole in this discourse where too often we've been looking at this story and the documentary and the blessing video controversy from the African point of view, which is very important, don't get me wrong, but understanding it from the business and racial point of view from the Chinese side is just as important. She brought up one issue that I wanted to get your take on about the role of media. And I've been thinking about this in the context of Chinese media, because when you see a lot of the portrayals of Africa and Africans in Chinese media, and recently this was very high profile with a Tencent miniseries that came out called Ebola Fighters. And the narrative on Ebola Fighters you know, it was one of these miniseries, six, seven part miniseries, like we see on Netflix. And it was basically the Han Savior complex that she talked about. We also saw this in Wolf Warrior. And this was from a couple of years ago, that huge blockbuster where the Chinese kind of savior complex comes to Africa, to some fictitious African country, kills lots of white people, and then saves Africans. And so the context behind these videos and surrounding these videos within the broader Chinese media space, I think in many ways fuels the industry of exploiting people through these blessing videos and other ways like this. What's your take on that? Yeah, I, I can I can see that point. The um, I think I think it, it, it to my mind it, it also fits into it fits into a wider kind of narrative that that's being told. I think about China as a kind of a you know as this the the, the complications of of the narrative that, that China has with the global south, right? Kind of which is a combination of. We're all developing countries, and yet we are also a natural leader for developing countries. You know, so so th there's always this kind of like ambiguous kind of like double aspect of, of that, uh, you know, kind of in that narrative. And this sense seems to me to kind of really play into that. Um, also because, you know, like a lot of, um, like a, 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 a year or two ago when the last time when, when during this, this spring festival broadcast, when there was all of these kind of scandals Handles about about Chinese performers performing in blackface. Around that time, I, I I argued that that a lot of this, you know, kind of is a way for for Chinese for 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 the the enhanced or the in in larger Chinese kind of global global presence to be explained back to Chinese people. Um, and, you know, in a similar way as one would see in 1950s Hollywood movies, for example, where you would frequently also find a kind of a, a situation of, of, of a, a person, a blonde, frequently a blonde woman, kind of dancing and, and interacting with locals, you know, kind of whether those locals happen to be like whether they're kind of dressed up as, you know, kind of Pacific Islanders or, you know, kind of whatever particular kind of fetishized kind of like racial other happen to happen in, in, in the, that particular movie. You see a similar kind of kind of positioning of China as the the modern, the advanced, and you know, kind of, you know, in a kind way interacting with the with the non-modern other, you know, um in, in kind of media media studies terms. And um, you know, so so a lot of this, you know, struck me as a kind of a trying to kind of move a, a country that is still very, very focused on itself. Um, trying to kind of like shift it along the you know kind of an, into a new identity where it's now also needs to be actively and constantly engaging with the rest of the world um you know which 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 is a, a kind of a it's it's a normal kind of like process for a superpower to take but it's never it's never a very smooth one and um you know and and the flip side of that is today we 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 featured this really interesting article about Chinese social media responses to the Sri Lanka debt crisis 
this. Um, and particularly like all of this anger, this kind of popular anger in China about possible possible kind of, um, you know, Chinese kind of concessions or losses in, in the resolution of the, of the Sri Lankan debt crisis. And you see there the flip side of this issue, right? Kind of like, oh, you know, because the, the flip side of, of we're very kind in the, re in the rest of the world and all of these people are grateful to us for our help. The flip side of that, and you see that a lot in, in, in white racism as well, is we are out here in the world doing all these nice things for other people and they are not grateful enough. Um, you know, so, so, so like it's, this is a kind of a, it's a miasma, right? Kind of like it's, 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 it's one of these, it's, it's a very complicated discourse that tends, to, that tends to be messy on all of the different sides. But, but in, in the end, like what, what, what one of the jobs that this discourse does is to make people more used to some kind of like global role and this kind of exposure to the world. And so, you know, so, so to a certain extent, I think that it's going to be very interesting to see where all of this is going, um, you know, particularly against the, the background of very strong narratives of victimization and racial nationalism that's, that's happening in China at the same time, and a government that's very, that's generally relatively happy to let those discourses run because it, it serves other purposes for them. Um, you know, so, so I think all of this is emerging, is very interesting, but it's also, I think, emerging as quite a possibly dangerous situation. It is, but at the same time, Kobus, when I was listening to everything that you were saying, it's fascinating because there are very stark parallels to the discourse here in the United States as well. And in many ways, what the Chinese are saying is not that unique or exceptional. So you talk about this sense of victimization and this this sense that we're doing all this for others, but they don't appreciate us. Uh, that is very much part of the white conservative narrative in the United States that fuels the GOP and the Republican Party. And that was very much part of Trump. You ask the average American how much money they think they're spending to help other people. And they think it's like 10% of their budget. It's actually one one thousandth of the US federal budget. But yet there is this sense of victimization that everybody's ripping us off, everybody is taking advantage of us. And here in the United States, there's a sense of white grievance as well that fuels the right. And so it's just interesting how social media is fueling a lot of these, these narratives, but this populist victimization narrative is not unique to the Han or the Chinese. Again, not meant to excuse anything that they're saying, but I just hear a lot of parallels in what you are saying to what I'm seeing here in the US as well. So, sorry to interrupt you, um, but like, just continuing on that point, I completely agree with you. And like one of one of the one of the kind of additional parallels that I'm seeing is this, you know, this this fight in the US in, in certain certain states in the US where they're trying to to outlaw kind of racism education. You know, um, this this kind of and particularly around around this kind of talking point of critical race theory, which is kind of absurd. You know, kind of like focus on critical race theory in in, in some Republican races. But the, the issue there is, you know, is around this issue of not wanting to make white people uncomfortable, right? Kind of not wanting, not wanting to to kick off the entire process of questioning one's own subjectivity that that as is part and parcel of of questioning institutional racism, and you know, kind of, and and it's it's very interesting for me to watch this parallel process happening within the U.S. and in China, because. As an Afrikaner, and particularly as an Afrikaner that that happened to come of age at a moment in the nineties, I was one. I was was you know kind of I came of age at exactly the the, the moment that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was happening in, within South Africa, and one of the things that I'm realizing is that. You know, the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was extremely flawed in many ways, but it, in lots of ways it was also this kind of very rare instance of a full radical examination of an entire culture and a really like a kind of an unpacking of the racial implications of Africana culture in relation to culture, in relation to commerce, in relation to mining, in relation to every single aspect of religion, like every single aspect of Afrikaans' life was unpacked in this very, very critical way and, and shown to be complicit in a larger structural racist order. And as a person from that culture undergoing that process at a moment when I was coming of age, I now, in retrospect, realize how a radicalizing kind of process that is, because it makes one look at one's entire life and one's ancestors and one's whole family existence in this completely different, like kind of radical, radically different reframing. 
And these kind of Republican campaigners around issues like critical race theory and also I think what we're seeing in China is a resistance to that process. You know, it's a resistance to thinking to thinking differently about oneself. Um, and a trying and an attempt to kind of conserve ideas about what like these kind of like ideas of who one is, even if those ideas are happen to also then include a very strong kind of like dash of like victimization narratives, you know? So so in that sense, like, you know, it's 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 very interesting just for me to see the parallels. Cobus, very quickly before we go, you mentioned Sri Lanka. Let's have a quick discussion of some of the other news that's going on this week. Obviously, this was the week that for us, the big story in our Global South coverage was the reemergence of Chinese President Xi Jinping on the stage when he met with Indonesian President Joko Widodo. We covered a lot of that. And then the burgeoning debt crisis, not just in Sri Lanka, but also in Zambia and in Laos and in many other countries. We were expecting uh, a big announcement from the creditor committee in Paris who is working on the Zambian debt issues. We're recording this show on Thursday. They said, uh, let's see, about two or three weeks ago that before the end of the month, so that before the end of July, which tomorrow is the last working day, if I recall, let me just check the calendar, but I think tomorrow is the last working day in, no, yes, tomorrow is in fact the last working day of the month. So if they don't have an announcement tomorrow, people are going to be very disappointed, but this is a really, really important announcement coming out of Zambia because many people are expecting it that this debt announcement will be used as a template in other countries that have large amounts of Chinese debt. Just very quickly before we go, a couple reflections on the news of the week. Yeah, the, you know, kind of debt is such a kind of like a multi-headed kind of monster of a problem at the moment. So, so the, you know, kind of we, we keep kind of returning to it in different aspects. One of, one of the things that I will really kind of look out for is not only how the Chinese creditors are, are, are treated, but specifically how different kinds of Chinese creditors are treated in the Zambian debt resolution, if there is, if that kind of detail is released. But then also how Western bondholders are going to be are going to be treated in comparison, because Western bond debt is a big part and a very un, under-examined part of these debt crises. It only, it isn't only a simple situation where China where Chinese debt is the only problem. Um, so so that that I think is is, is really important. Um, the other you know kind of very important thing is is to is some of the kind of wider regional fallout from from uh, U.S. China tensions, particularly in relation to to um, the to Nancy Pelosi's possible visit to Taiwan um, and how that that might kind of like impact wider regional dynamics, you know, kind of in 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 the area. Um, obviously, at, at a moment when when China. Um, uh, Southeast Asia relations are, you know, at, at a moment where there's a there's a lot of action on all fronts, um, and then finally, you know, kind of also just just the kind of ongoing kind of impacts of of you know changes in China's China's economy and how that is reverberating across all of these different sectors around the world. So if you want to find out what China is doing in the global South, there really is no better way than to subscribe to the China Global South Project. Uh, you know, I mean, it's been so revelatory for me being here in the United States for the first time in years to see how narrow the discourse is and how difficult it is to find information, good information on these issues. Yes, you can sit there and scroll through Twitter endlessly and you can find a whole bunch of information, but it's very hard to sort through what's legit, what's not legit who's credible, who's not credible. We've got a team of eight people who are doing that every single day who put together this fantastic newsletter. We have podcasts in French and Arabic and our services now are, are in those languages as well. So go to chinaglobalsouth.com slash subscribe and you can get a free trial for 30 days just to see what we're doing. And if you like it, then we would be so grateful for you to support our work and to continue receiving the newsletter. If you don't like it, okay, enjoy the free month and there you go. So, uh, you know, we just love to hear from you. And Cobus and I are super accessible. So if you want to reach us, you can find me at Eric, E-R-I-C at ChinaAfricaProject.com or Cobus at C-O-B-U-S at ChinaAfricaProject.com. Let's leave the discussion there for this week. We'll be back again next week with another Another episode of the China in Africa podcast. Until then, for Cobus van Staden, I'm Eric Olander. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Tag us on Twitter at China GS Project and visit us at ChinaGlobalSouth.com. If you speak French, check out our full coverage at projetafriquechine.com and 
Afrique Chine on Twitter. That's Afrique with a K. And you'll also find links to our sites and social media channels in Arabic. <laughs> <laughs>